Okay. Uh, before we get started again, Jordan has asked me to announce that there's more popcorn in the back that needs to be eaten before we're done. Um, again, there's a donation bowl at the front. If you all could spare anything for the presenters, it, the money goes directly to them. And uh, free posters at the front. I'd like to everyone to be aware that the next lecture is actually going to be next Sunday. We're having uh, Mr. Freibert uh, present on a uh, lecture on the Weird Magazine release. And it's going to be a little party. So that's going to be awesome. So anyway, next we're going to bring up Sam Corman. Um, as I mentioned before, Sam's visiting from St. Louis, where he's the director of White Flag, uh, the assistant director of White Flag Projects there in St. Louis. Um, and White Flag has fantastic programming, so check that out. Um, but he's also an independent curator and writer. Uh, in addition to founding the Carhole Gallery in Portland, Oregon, Sam has curated exhibitions in Portland, Marfa, St. Louis, and now Baltimore. So we're really excited to have him here because for the past few months, Sam has been working on the current exhibition down at Sophia Jacob, The Absolute Comic, which opened last night. Uh, and it runs through March, so please check out the exhibition. Please check out the catalog that's at the front and look for that on the Sophia Jacob website as well. Um, so let's welcome Sam up. Um, I guess first I want to say thank you to everyone at Sophia Jacob, Jordan, David, and Stephen. You've been incredibly hospitable. Um, I'm, you know, regretfully returning to St. Louis tomorrow. I've had such a good time in Baltimore, and um, I think I can speak for both Zoe and Chase that we've had just a wonderful time and felt extremely welcome. Um, and yeah, so thanks. Um, so the lecture topic tonight is the Piero figure, um, which I guess it's fortunate that it's a full moon because the Piero and the full moon are really intertwined kind of in the myth of this kind of comic figure. And I'll kind of give you a bit more of a backstory um, about just who this is. Um, but basically, um, this sort of served as the lens through which um, the exhibition was organized and specifically through uh, Charles Baudelaire's essay um, on the essence of laughter, wherein he discusses a Piero performance that he saw in London. Um, so basically, uh, you know, moving on after the Baudelaire essay and looking more into humor and comedy and kind of in an effort to give a little bit of a backstory and frame just how I'm going to approach this figure. Um, I'd like to discuss the work of a few critics um, and philosophers who've discussed humor. Um, and so basically for all of these, um, for all of these thinkers, they've looked at humor, laughter, um, and comedy, and these are kind of the typical divisions that they fall within as they're discussing kind of funny stuff. Um, and for many reasons, it's an attractive object of inquiry. Uh, it's mysterious, it's inscrutable, um, it's a physical, visceral type of sensation, um, it's automatic, it's unconscious, it's a very populist form, um, but, and this is kind of true of all of their texts, they always preface their arguments um, by saying that once you place this very funny thing that kind of takes place in a social exchange under a microscope that it's not funny uh, and that kind of academic criticism tends to um, kill it and that it sort of falls apart under that lens. So they all sort of resort to these other forms um, of looking at it and basically say, I can only give you a descriptive account of a handful of examples wherein I've laughed or wherein comedy has been sort of generally assumed to be the situation. Um, and it's kind of doomed to fail in a certain way. So just to discuss briefly who these people are that I was looking at, um, here's a few funny headshots of all of them. It's nice that they're all like post photography, so there are these great images of all of them. Um, so basically the first one in the upper left hand corner is our friend Sigmund Freud. Um, and he's discussed humor 
very directly in two texts, one which is a book-length essay, The Joke and Its Relation to the Unconscious, published in 1905, and also a later essay in 1928, just entitled Humor. Um, the former book basically presents um, jokes as a situation by which a very nervous energy and tension um, is released. And then the latter, um, in humor, he talks about the superego as sort of acting as a conscience and a corrective force to reality and kind of uh, situates the ego back in place and allows it to envision uh, a different, better reality. Um, Still on the top row, we have the French philosopher Henri Bergson, who published a text entitled Laughter, an essay on the meaning of the comic in 1900. Um, he's a French phenomenologist, and he describes laughter basically um, in three different ways. He kind of finds three kind of inalienable facts about humor and about laughter. Basically, that laughter is strictly human, uh, laughter requires indifference to acknowledge the seriousness of a situation, um, disallows laughter to occur, um, and that laughter is kind of uh, intrinsically social, uh, that it requires a certain complicity, that it's not solely um, in the appeal to the intellect, and that it's actually a part um, of the, or basically serves as a texture for life. Um, on the bottom row, uh, the most contemporary looking of these men uh, is Simon Kreitley, and his text on humor published in 2002 kind of picks up after Freud, uh, and for him, humor is sort of a knowing smirk, um, and that it's not actually this comic, bombastic laughter, but that actually uh, it, humor is something else and sort of takes after Freud in talking about the superego being this corrective force. And it's, and that knowing smirk is basically an acknowledgement of difference. And as a slight aside, he coined one of the best puns I've ever read in philosophy to describe fart jokes. He called them post-colonial uh, jokes, which is riffing on post-colonial criticism. So, after the colonial. And then the other prod, er, then the other writer we have is Charles Baudelaire, and his on the essence of laughter, basically equates laughter with the body and also with sin, and kind of acts as an acknowledgement of superiority and a kind of masochism against the person um, who you're laughing at. It's also grounded in disgust, and this is where he begins to talk about the Piero, and he's attended a performance of the Piero figure um, in London, wherein he, uh, after you know, performing all these lewd acts, is beheaded, and then in the last moment uh, reaches down and picks up his own head and stuffs it in his pocket and leaves the stage. So with the Piero figure, and just to give you a little history, um, it originated in the late 17th century in the Italian Commedia dell'arte, which was a popular form of entertainment, a form of public theater. It traveled all around Italy and then eventually it dispersed throughout Western Europe into Germany, into France, and also into the UK. Um, basically, the Piero figure is in love with his beautiful girlfriend, Columbine, who eventually leaves him for uh, kind of the superior harlequin. And the Piero always, uh, you know, to varying degrees, embodies certain um, characteristics such as naivete, innocence, um, a strong sense of individualism, and he's always a fool because he sort of uh, takes after his desires in this very automatic way um, and kind of performs them um, without real consideration as to the results. And hence that leads to him losing Columbine to Harlequin. Um, and so this has really allowed the Piero to be a very, um, to be a very kind of plastic figure. He's very mutable and has appeared in a lot of different ways and been adopted by a lot of different movements, partially because he's always mute. This is the origination of the mime, um, that he's solely visually expressive. Uh, and he becomes kind of this perfect vehicle um, to represent uh, you know, different metaphors for the artist, whether it's the alienation of the Romantic period, or you move into early modernism and he represents this very camp figure, this very base figure, 
um, and that in each case he sort of represented a certain level of alienation and suffering. Um, so we'll talk about the first person, which is Antoine Watteau's Piero um, from 1718 to 1719. And this is a painting that I've loved for a long time. And it depicts a very sad, solitary figure amidst the crowd. It appears as though he's sort of forgotten his lines. He's in his very funny costume, but he looks totally foolish in this very innocent white costume and big collar. And there's a sense that he's, in some ways, acknowledged his position, in other ways that he's sort of still acting, that there's a force that's taken over and that there's a certain responsibility that he has to continuing. And Watteau sees this as a very sympathetic figure for representing sort of the plight of the artist. Another example where I'll play a video, which is a clip from uh, Arthur Schoenberg's Piero Lunaire, which Stravinsky called the solar plexus, as well as the mind of early modernist or 20th century music. everyone was able to understand this disjunctive and very operatic German. But basically, uh, Schoenberg saw in the Piero figure something both as a hero and a fool. And this piece is very um, kind of significant in the development of the Piero and bringing it into the modern era because it plays on the various representations of the Piero and playing on it as both high art and cabaret. Um, it's rife with puns, but it's also based on a suite of poems. Um, it's song, but also speech, and it's drama, but also concert. And so this is kind of the paradox of the Piero and kind of this um, ultimate innocence that he possesses. Um, so moving on again, so we can move further, and there's numerous examples of the Piero, so I'm just giving a very cursory description of them. Um, won't go. There we go. So we have 1965, Piero Le Fou, Jean-Luc Godard's movie. Um, and the Piero figure is kind of transformed um, from just innocent confidence to affect and alienation in this kind of anticlimactic adventure crime story that uh, Godard uses sort of as a critique of bourgeois society. And at the end, uh, instead of the Piero figure being isolated and alone without the love of his life, uh, he's actually um, kind of haphazardly blows himself up, so. Another work, Bruce Nauman's Clown Torture. <laughs> So for Nauman, the clown figure, which can be, rep which can be thought about also as a Piero, um, really embodies the kind of masochism that it takes to watch this innocent figure really fall so many times and really kind of uh, exaggerates that feeling in, a very, in sort of a humor noir. Um, So there's a lot, there are many, many examples, as I've said, 
Marcel Marceau, David Bowie does a really interesting Piero performance. Um, the Joker in the Dark Knight, um, where the Piero is an instrument of chaos. And then also, um, probably the most ironic Piero figure is Krusty the Clown. And I think this brings it back to um, the populist form that the Piero originated from. Um, and basically makes him, um, at least for me, one of the most sympathetic Pieros. Um, this is perhaps because I spent a large portion of my life invested in The Simpsons. But just sort of to argue for Krusty's consideration as a Piero. He's estranged from his family. He has numerous addictions that he can't control, such as smoking, drinking, and gambling. He is, in, he is innocent insofar as he is illiterate. Uh, to state the obvious, he's a clown. His skits frequently fail. He is markedly indulgent. In one particular episode, he ate at least a dozen Fabergé eggs. <laughs> and then he's all of this while still unable to truly express himself because he's a children's entertainer. He's after money, fame, and forever, even at the Simpsons' home in one particular episode, a clown looking for attention and love. And then just one last bit of laughter from our friend. <laughs> I also think if there's no questions, we can probably put on the Oscars streaming right now. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's something so malleable about the Piero figure, I think, in being a mime and also being, you know, so base in a certain way that it's the perfect way to use it to, to your own ends. And so I think, like, the Anger film's just, like, a, yet another example of someone being able to adopt this um, figure, this, you know, extremely um, versatile floating sign. Thank you.